mentioned several other shrines in Chandi Sehu, which we can still recognize today. The shrine of the three arched bitches. This is one of the smaller temples at Sehu. He also mentions that there are all these other empty niches, which probably had once been for bronze statuary. So already a lot of the actual remains had been removed by the time the British arrived. Well, he mentions he was struck by the giant kawa heads, such as this one at the upper right, the Stephen here. And the base with a spout not resembling any European workmanship, this we would now call a kindi, from an Indian Sanskrit word, kundika, which again, one of these uh, kindis here is carrying in hand. He was looking for inscriptions. The, the British were already aware of the importance of trying to document the early writings. And he was disappointed when they couldn't find any. Uh, the guide only showed him some of the workman's marks on the interior of the walls. But he couldn't find any ancient historical documents here. On his way back to the, he calls it the Chinaman's house, there was a Chinese toll booth. The road between Zhongzhou and Seoul at this time, he had to pay to travel on it. And the toll keepers, and many of these were Chinese. And uh, there was no other place to stay. They stayed in the Chinaman's house, as they say. And uh, they saw another complex with 14 to 16 buildings. Again, we can still recognize this one. Has been restored as Changi Rumbo. And walking toward Jokja, across the river, the Kali Puas, they saw several very large Jain images. Again, we now know these are Buddhists. We know that there was never any Jainism in Southeast Asia. But in those days, they were more familiar with Jain because that still existed in India. And uh, so these large statues are probably sitting exactly where Mackenzie saw them back in the 1980s. And now they're, and they're just fenced in there next to a lumber yard. The next day, they walked about to one and a half to two miles south. But this is not south, this is east. I think we got mixed up. He saw some more giant garden statues and a two-story temple. More about he's talking about Tandi Pausa, which is my favorite temple. It's still right in the middle of the rice fields, as you can see. And he's very happy because he found an inscription written in what he recognizes as Bengali type script, Devanagari. Here are the giant you know, guardians, the porters, and the door guardians still in C2. It was in between these that the inscription was discovered. Then they went to the hills south of Parmanan looking for a krato, a palace, in other words, in Javanese, of an ancient Raja. And they found meditation caves. And that's what you see the, in this picture here, the various pictures. And the staircase, which the natives said the Susu Hunans, <clears throat> when embarrassed or melancholy, in Mackenzie's words, used to retire and shut themselves up for eight days of fasting and meditation. And people still go and meditate in these caves that you see in the lower left here. There was a giant sannyasi in the posture of meditation facing the first cell Muslim <coughs> statue there which has now vanished or been moved somewhere else. And they also found what they called the Royal Kratal, which they couldn't enter because it was all covered with vegetation, it was raining, and it was getting dark. And they had to climb down the hill again. As you can see, the hill is a relatively high plateau uh, overlooking the Brahman and playing a very nice location. And he was told the story of why it was called a palace, a Kratal. This is a relief of the story still in the now it's told that in the uh, this is the uh, airport in uh, Georgia. And what it is is a story about um, um, an unhappy love affair uh, between a prince and a princess. There was this prince who's shown at the left here, tickling the woman's chin. That's Om Bandung Gondoloso, who was in love with the He lived up on the hill. And uh, the princess, uh, Lo Jongrad, a slender maiden, uh, who lived in a temple down below, um, uh, and her father ruled the Lowland Kingdom. And so he was in love with her, but she didn't love him. And so then the, the prince from the hill launched a war, conquered the Lowland King, and said that uh, he, he threatened to kill everybody unless she married him. And so the princess agreed to, but only on the condition that she built, that he built her a thousand temples in one night. So here is a... Uh, um, so here, he, instead he goes into meditation with his guru, and he gets all the demons to come out from the underworld. So here they are coming to life, coming up from the underworld, making things out of the rocks, building thousands and thousands, of, or hundreds and hundreds of temples, and the slender maiden, Lodo Jolbron, then sees that she's actually going to afford to be forced to marry this guy, she never expected. She's going to have to do that. 
And so she gets her palace women out of bed in the middle of the night and asks them to start pounding rice. And this wakes up the roosters, because this is what Japanese women obviously did every morning before dawn, pound rice for the day's meal. And the roosters woke up, and they thought it was morning. So they started to crow. And all the demons then ran away and hid in the ground because they couldn't stay out in the sun. So she didn't have to marry him, but instead he cursed her and turned into her into the statue, which we still see in the temple today. <laughs> and so the story is that is the Krato, the palace of this king, who uh, then for, was forced to build these 999 temples. From up on a hill, I think it was probably a palace garden. In many cases, these old palace gardens used to have meditation spots in them. Uh, this particular one here, which they call the Kraton still today, it's got a pool next to it. If you look at it from outside, it's got this high wall. Inside it has two platforms linked by a kind of a bridge. It's a very unique structure. This is looking at it in a plan view. Actually, um, about 20 years ago, we had a, a, a conference in Georgia in which there was a, a Sri Lankan archaeologist, and he says, actually, there are lots of these in one particular area of Sri Lanka. And so I went through Sri Lanka and had a look at the site, and it's exactly the same plan as the ones on this palace site here. So no doubt this was an imitation of a monastery of a particular ascetic sect of Buddhist monks, which had, was somewhat influential in Java in the 9th century. Quite an interesting feature. So it's called a Krato, and it's probably not the palace. It's probably a monastery attached to the palace. And there's that big entranceway. So there's a big kind of alu nalu or palace square here. That's probably where the actual kind of um, quarters would have been for the king when he came up onto this plateau. And then the monastery is separate from that. It's down the way over here. And the caves are up here. So it was like the modern Tamansari in Jolja, uh, if you go there. You can still see a kind of a combination of palace garden and meditation area. On the way to Jolja, they passed several other large ruined complexes. This is about 18 kilometers from, from Banan into uh, Jolja. And he was particularly struck by the interiors of these uh, old temples, whereas he said, we find no paltry niches for stinking lamps, no soot for vestige of oil burning and soiling the interior. Um, of no accumulation of doors, recesses, monstrous figures, and obscene symbols. Um, all is unity, light, and truth. In other words, he liked the Japanese temples much better than all the Indian ones he had seen. Of course, they were much older. And uh, he had, of course, in India, what he saw was temples that were in use. A lot of them did have lamps and other kinds of incense burning in them, which would have stained the walls. Um, but uh, still, he was very impressed by the quality of the standard of the stone carving. He mentions these statues of elephants with men leaning over them. We can still see these particular statues today. They're at the entrance door to the main uh, shrine here. This is Chandisari today. And uh, he also mentions that, uh, well, he doesn't mention that on the interior, we can still find remains of painting on plaster in the interior. Um, and the painting was actually scripts. They were writing something on the walls of the interior of this probably some kind of Buddhist mantras. This was a Buddhist site. And you can still see lots of the plaster remaining stuck to the external walls. Now, most people don't believe me when I tell them that these sites actually were all plastered and painted. They would have looked like a modern Hindu temple here in Singapore. They would have looked like the temples in Sri, Mar uh, Sri Mariaman or the London Tanks Road or so on. But they were all covered with plaster. And the, and the few sites in Java, they still remain. Um, and so Mackenzie says, it's not without reluctance I left these interesting ruins. And he'd been in India for, as we saw, more than 10 years. So he was impressed by the Javanese. And uh, while I was surveying them with mixed emotions of regret and pleasure, it was impossible for their ruminating on the origin of edifices so widely different in style. This is Mackenzie's spelling. For we are taught to expect in these countries at a remote era. And so why they differ from their present state? In other words, this is the first real European realization of what a civilization had once existed. This is 50 years before Angkor Wat. So this was the first impression that Europeans had of the importance of the civilizations of uh, Southeast Asia, not just Java. As in the Western temple of Kali Sari, Chandi Sari, the whole of the outside walls, sculptured figures and pedestals have been covered with a thin coat of fine plaster. 
again, Mackenzie's spelling. The inside apartments also, and the Mr. Chan Bisari, have been plastered in this manner. So that's still there. Parts of it are still there. But most of it has worn off in the last 200 years, unfortunately. <clears throat> Mackenzie was apparently thrown off the center of Buddhism because you don't have things like reclining Buddhas, which are so important for places like Sri Lanka and the other Buddhist areas of Southeast Asia. There are no reclining Buddhas in Indonesia. This was not part of the Japanese iconographical system. So Mackenzie had, was on the right track, but he never quite made the right connection. This is in Sri Lanka, of course. OK, Mackenzie is one very interesting person attached to Raffles, who was responsible for a lot of the work that the British did in recording these sites. Another one was in America. And he was born in Bethlehem, near Philadelphia, where my brother lives today. Uh, he was born in 1773. He got his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania, which still exists, of course, in 1798. He was very interested in things like poison oak and poison sumac, the kind of poisonous plants that irritate you. Uh, he learned French and German while he was there in uh, Penn. And then he went to Jakarta or Batavia in 1800 as a doctor on an American ship because Philadelphia was the major American port in the late 19th century. And so he was on one of these probably predecessors of the tea clippers coming to Batavia. Because of course one of the main reasons for having an American Revolution was that the Brits didn't allow the Americans to trade with China. That was one of the main instigators. Uh, so that's one of the things they started doing. As soon as America got independence, they started shipping to the East Indies. And uh, so they went to Jakarta quite often. They went to Sumatra. They went to Aceh, for example. And there's a lot of these interesting uh, dot, the ship's logs in Salem, Massachusetts, all the early uh, pepper traders and so on. So um, then he went as a doctor, stayed there for two months, became very interested in the island came back again the next year and remained there for 17 years. He was interested in Java's botany. He was very interested in looking at the, the, the he was very fascinated by the, the old uh, story, the legend of the, uh, the upas tree, the poison tree, a very popular old Indonesian legend about the tree which you cannot go near because you'll die if you go close to it. Uh, the, the upas means poison in, in Malay Indonesian. And uh, so there's no such tree, but the legend was quite influential for a long time. So basically he was interested in poisonous plants and then all kinds of medicinal plants. And so he got himself attached to the, the Dutch East India Company um, and he went around also inspecting temples. This is Chandi Sari. Around the time Mackenzie went there, he went there also and it's a little self-portrait of him. Say so his sketchbook and his majoring rod and here's his job his assistant. So he joined the Dutch colonial army as a surgeon, and he was assigned to go and study exactly what he wanted to do, local plants and uh, traditional Japanese medicine. Now, most Dutch, even the official civil servants, were very tightly controlled by the, the Dutch uh, um, company. They weren't allowed to go more than about 15 kilometers from where they were based. Um, the Dutch gave him unusual freedom of movement so he could go and study the plants and he made full use of it. So the Dutch all envied him because he could travel around where they couldn't. He went to Pramana when Cornelius, the Dutch surveyor, was doing his work there in 1805. And he climbed many volcanoes, Tankuban Prahu, Merapi, Lao, Bromo. Um, he moved to Solo in 1809 and stayed in a big house near the market. And of course, this is part of the Solo Palace. This is the Songo Bono Tower, where the sultans of the Susuhunans, as they call them in Solo, are supposed to um, commune with the Queen of the South Sea. They have the same legend there as in Zhoujiao, or as in Angkor. Now, this is one of the ancient uh, pavilions probably brought to Solo from East Java when the kingdom moved back there from East Java. So he was living in the center of what was a very important uh, historical place for several years. So 1809. Before the British invaded, he was already living there, and he spoke English and Dutch, and he drew things like this rhinoceros. It was captured in Kedu around Borobudur. In the 19th century, there were rhinoceroses all over Java. They were just a common animal then. And now, of course, there were only maybe 10 of them left in one little reserve in Ujo Kulo in West Java. In the 19th century, they were pests in people's gardens. They were that common. 
And there was one of these in the Soho Palace Menagerie, so we drew this one 